Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for the opportunity to join you. I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but I'm very uh, pleased to be giving this presentation on innovations in the prediction and warning of severe storms and tornadoes. I'm sure we're going to have some really lively discussions, and I wish I could be there with you to, uh, to join in them. Um, obviously, any of us who've seen storms, especially in the part of the country you're at right now, out of Texas Tech, obviously the storms are very beautiful. They're powerful, <clears throat> but they're also very deadly. Um, if you look at the historical record of billion dollar weather and climate disasters put together by NOAA, just for, for 2021, you see that um, there are very significant numbers of, of events along the Gulf Coast, in the Midwest, the Southeast, uh, storms, tornadoes, floods, uh, landfalling hurricanes and so on, very, very significant number. And if you look at these over the years, these same graphics, these infographs, you'll see basically that um, they look kind of similar. Uh, but in fact, if you look at a time history of the events, this is the uh, consumer price index, adjust, index adjusted cost in billions over here on the right axis, you'll see the number increasing. Uh, green and yellow are severe storms and hurricanes respectively. You'll see the cost uh, to our nation is about a half a trillion dollars. So the, these are events, events are extremely significant, obviously uh, impacting the economy and livelihood of, um, of millions of individuals. Fatality wise, uh, these are the 2020 numbers with, uh, with averages over years. You look at tornadoes, uh, on the order of uh, 70 to almost 100 people die on average in tornadoes in our country every year. So very, very significant. And of course, this really speaks to the issue of improving the warning and forecast system, dissemination systems for both severe storms and tornadoes. I think it's important to kind of take a retrospective look at where we were uh, several years ago, several decades ago, in fact. Uh, Doppler radar was coming into its own in the um, late 1970s and early 1980s through a number of projects at the National Severe Storms Laboratory. So Doppler radar was evolving. Uh, numerical simulation models at that time were basically three-dimensional cloud models. Uh, and you can see some of this work by uh, Bob uh, Wilhelmson and Joe Clamp. Uh, at that time, we did not have really good color graphics. Uh, this is a, um, a shaded image on a line printer of a, uh, a storm and its rotational characteristics. And even pipe cleaners were used back then to really understand the, the three-dimensional structure of storms. So we may do with what we could, what we had, and, uh, and it was actually pretty, uh, pretty decent. Uh, what was an interesting development along those lines with the three-dimensional numerical cloud simulation models, uh, this is a numerical simulation here, a three-dimensional uh, image from this paper by Klimp Wilhelmsen and Peter Ray. And uh, these are three-dimensional radar observations of reflectivity. And, and the thing that you see here is the model is able to capture some of the twisting rotational structure in the storm. And this area right here, the so-called weak echo vault, shows an area of extremely strong updraft. So by this time, the numerical models were showing the ability to capture some of the, at least the very basic characteristics of three-dimensional uh, thunderstorms uh, uh, over time. And this is quite a, a major development. Something important happened, though, uh, in the late, uh, uh, late 70s and early 80s in terms of the use of these models. Uh, there was, in particular, a storm that uh, multiple splitting storm around Fort Sill, Oklahoma, on April 3rd of 1964. Uh, these are the observations of reflectivity in different colors here, showing the storm was splitting multiple times over a period of, um, of about four hours. And uh, this same storm system was simulated with a three-dimensional model by uh, Bob Wilhelmson and Joe Klimp. And really remarkably, the simulation showed tremendous uh, agreement with what the actual observations were showing. And Bob commented, he was my advisor, he said, the atmosphere finally did what the model had been doing for a long time. The model had been producing these multiple splits, but finally the atmosphere got its act together and did the same thing. And that was quite intriguing. This was a very, very important um, uh, paper because it really showed the possibility of using models to not only simulate, but to actually predict these types of storms. Now, I had the great fortune of working with a brilliant man at, at the University of Oklahoma, OU, uh, Doug Lilly. He came uh, to OU in uh, 1982, came from NCAR, and uh, he published a series of, uh, of really seminal papers looking at the possibility of predicting uh, thunderstorms with the use of numerical models, especially strongly rotating storms, which he showed with the concept of helicity borrowed from turbulence theory, you could actually get some stabilizing effect uh, in rotation. Uh, and so we had the 3D storm models back then. Uh, these were much more sophisticated models, uh, uh, much more sophisticated graphics as time went on. Uh, computing was on the right trajectory. Uh, computing power uh, back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s was clearly on the rise. We had Cray systems back then, and clearly uh, computing was, was increasing as we saw 
multiple uh, processor machines being developed. Uh, Craze had four and then eight processors and 16 processors. That was quite revolutionary. Uh, NEXRAD was on the horizon, the National Doppler Weather Radar Network. That technology developed at the Sphere Storms Laboratory uh, back in the uh, early se late 70s and early 80s was showing uh, great promise. And so a surveillance network was, um, was on the horizon. And finally, also networking was expanding. You may remember the NSFNet backbone built off DARPAnet uh, back in the day. And so there was a clear, clear evolution and a clear sense that we were going to have the capability to possibly predict storms if we could show that it was, uh, it was in fact doable. And so we asked a crazy question uh, at OU back in the late 1980s. We said, Con computer forecast model technology been around for a long, long time. Uh, could it actually be applied to explicitly predict the kinds of weather that is extremely high impact and local, like this squall line moving through Oklahoma? And uh, the opportunity came for us to pull everything together in a proposal. Uh, the NSF, National Science Foundation, uh, put together a science and technology research centers program. It was a few years after the engineering research centers program. And this solicitation came out. And in fact, it was four pages long. It basically said, give us an idea that you think is maybe impossible to do. And, uh, and you know, convince us that, uh, that you're worthy of funding and, um, and we'll consider funding it. So Doug Lilly and I went for it. We actually wrote a proposal to NSF uh, and, uh, and lo and behold, uh, in fact, we got funded. Uh, and in fact, what we were proposing was to explicitly predict uh, numerical, uh, with numerical models, simulated uh, thunderstorms, the actual the thunderstorm evolution. And in theory, and some of the simple models of Ed Lorenz at MIT said that was impossible. You couldn't do that. In fact, the predictability time for those kinds of storms was probably on the order of 15 minutes. But yet Doug's work showed that certain types of storms that had rotating updrafts might be predictable for longer periods of time. And so, so was born the Center for Analysis and Prediction of Storms as one of the first 11 NSF science and technology centers that was basically created to demonstrate the capability of using computer models to predict uh, deep convective storms. Uh, now, of course, we had to have the necessary data. And if we hope to predict things like you see here, severe storms and the smaller structures of tornadoes, we had to have observations much finer scale than the upper air network and the surface observing network here in the United States. Of course, the answer was NEXRAD, which was commissioned formally in 1994 with about a, uh, 160 some radars around the country that really gave us those fine scale observations. Uh, the, the problem with Doppler radar, I should say it's really a challenge and a, and a fundamental limitation in terms of its characteristic was, of course, the wind is, is three dimensional as we know, but the radar only observes the radial component, that is the component parallel to the radar beam. And it also, of course, measures the reflectivity or the precipitation intensity. What our models needed was a whole lot more than that. Wind components, three wind components, temperature, humidity, pressure, multiple water substance fields, you know, rain, snow, hail, uh, ice, things like that, turbulence, and lots of other variables. And so really the, the goal of CAPS was to determine whether or not with a time series of only one wind component of observations from a single Doppler weather radar, and most of these radars did not overlap in their scan, so you really were dealing with single Doppler data, plus the precipitation in the 3D volume, uh, could you estimate all of the other 20-some variables you needed to uh, initialize the model? And so it's a highly underdetermined problem to which uh, we applied a lot of different types of optimal control theory and adjoints and stuff that I won't go into, but borrowed very, very heavily from the engineering community who do things like simulated annealing and calm and filtering and, and that uh, sort of thing is used uh, widely today. Uh, so I'll give you a quick example of, uh, of this work in action, uh, tornadic storms that occurred in Fort Worth, uh, Texas in uh, 2000, March of 2000, a uh, very severe tornado went through the uh, metro area. Here's the tornado, the hook echo on, uh, on TV radar. It's a very classic storm. Uh, if you look at a numerical model forecast from the Weather Service at that time, uh, south of the Red River here, that white oval, there was no explicit evidence of precipitation in North Texas. But of course, the forecasters knew something was going to happen. The environment was primed for severe storms. But the point here is that the model itself did not show explicit evidence of, uh, of convective storms. In reality, of course, uh, what happened was there were a, a series of tornadic storms south of the Red River in this, in this white box you see there. So uh, the model was unable to capture that. That was precisely the type of problem that CAPS was created to address. So what I'm showing you here is uh, some forecasts from our model. This is the radar observations at the top here at 6, 7, and 8 o'clock. Uh, uh, Fort Worth is in the pink star here. And the radar reflectivity is shown in the red. And this, this color I'm pointing at here, just northwest of Fort Worth, that is the storm that produced the tornado. Here it's moved southeast of Fort Worth, and here it's moved well out of the area. 
And so below here is showing the forecast from our model initialized with radar and other data two hours in advance, three hours and four hours in advance. And what you can see is a direct correspondence between the tornadic storm that hit Fort Worth and the storm in our model. It doesn't have all the detail. You see it's somewhat smoother and so on. But in fact, uh, that, that was in fact the same uh, storm. Now you'll also notice if you look closely at the picture, there are some storms that were ginned up by the model uh, that were not actually present in reality. Uh, so uh, you, you know, when you're trying to predict very local storms, if you're wrong, you're really, really wrong. And of course, this gets to the question of, um, of trust in a forecast. If you see this particular forecast as a forecaster, or, excuse me, that's the reality up there and the forecast is down below. The question is how much trust would you place in that? Of course, we use ensemble forecasting now to come up with a variety of initial conditions of the model that are slightly different from one another, but tend to produce dramatically different results. So the actual radar image you see uh, that I showed you earlier is shown here. And these, these white boxes are uh, five different forecasts, all of the same event, but started from slightly different initial conditions. And some of them are dramatically different from one another. But if you average them together and do variances, uh, you can actually uh, come up with probabilities. So here's the, the radar observations again here on the right. And this is the model forecast of probabilities of intense precipitation. And what you find out is where the model solutions tend to agree, the probabilities obviously are higher. And that tends to capture the more intense structures. And areas over here where the models disagree, the probability is much lower. And in fact, in reality, nothing happened over there. So ensemble forecasting, of course, is extremely important. It takes much more computer time because you're producing many more forecasts, but uh, that is really what's happening today. And in fact, if you look at a forecast from today's operational models, you'll see, in fact, they're able to capture a lot of the same fine scale structure uh, that we were um, uh, presuming and hoping to show back in the, uh, in the late 80s and through the 1990s, and now that's operational. So, uh, so in fact, these storms are predictable. Uh, now, of course, the million dollar question we all have is will computer models ever be able to predict an actual tornado? Now, of course, that's a very, very heavy lift. It not only takes a lot of computer time, there's a fundamental question of predictability. But I am going to show you an example of a tornado outbreak in Oklahoma from May of 2011. Uh, these, these tracks you see along the ground here are actual tornado tracks. And I'm going to show you a numerical forecast of a model that was run at a high enough resolution to at least capture the rotation that was uh, preceding what would have been a tornado. It's not the tornado itself, but it's the very strong tornado vortex signature on radar or the strong mesocyclone. And in the image that I'm gonna show you, I'll actually see the right, this is the storm tracks, the, um, the tornado tracks. And when I play this, uh, this loop, you're actually gonna see the radar reflectivity develop and the, the dark contours are gonna pop into the graph will show the vorticity, the vertical vorticity, the strong vertical spin. Uh, that is a proxy for the, uh, the tornado in the uh, simulation. So here come the storms, they're forming, initialized with radar data. And i am just kind of focus your attention down here. You'll see the black contours, there they are. See the black contours, that's rotation in the simulated storm. And notice how it's tracking quite well along with the um, actual observed track of a tornado. You'll see another one down here, which is completely spurious. <laughs> so once again, uh, when you're trying to do this type of forecasting, you can be really wrong and predict a tornado where in fact one did not occur. But this, this gives a hope, I think, that there's a possibility of us being able to use a numerical model uh, that spun up and initialized with Doppler weather radar data to capture potentially the evolution of a tornado. And certainly with much higher resolution and restarting the model every few minutes, and here you see a tornado developing uh, too late, uh, but there was another one that developed here tried to develop anyway along the track that already existed. So um, this is uh, job security <laughs> for those of us that are trying to do this sort of thing. We're a long way from doing it, but I think this gives us some promise, some hope that we might be able to one day uh, be able to predict um, tornadoes with numerical models. Now one has to ask the question, what happens if we succeed? Imagine what would happen if in fact we could predict a tornado an hour, hour and a half in advance, and um, what would people do with that information? Well, here's an example of something that happened in May of 2013 in Oklahoma, where a tornado had devastated more just 11 days earlier on May 20th of 2013. And another storm very similar to it formed in very much the same location. And the, uh, the, the TV stations and stuff were telling people it is a very bad storm. So what happened was people fled. They left their homes. Uh, all the egress routes south of Oklahoma City were absolute parking lots. And so some of the two lane roads that were two-way 
um, were one way. They turned them in, turned, you know, people, the drivers turned them into one way driving south and became a very dangerous situation. So what this does is it really tells us something about communicating information to the public and the fact that it's not just about a weather technology and understanding problem, it's about a social behavioral science problem. And in fact, if you look at this graphic here, in 1953, 519 people died in tornadoes in this country when the technology we had looked like this. <laughs> The tele wired telephones, we had no national radar network, we had a few black and white radars, we had uh, transistor or radios and TV was sort of in its infancy. That's 1953. Now fast forward to 2011, where 498 people died. So remember in 53, 519 died, in 2011, 498 died. And this was the technology we have in, uh, had in 2011. Now obviously, uh, many, many more people could have died had we not had this technology, but nevertheless, it begs the question of, of uh, you know, what influence uh, uh, do, do, do uh, you know, the warning system, the, the communication system have on people's behavior? And so now social behavioral scientists are very much involved in the watch and warning system, as I'll show you here in just a moment, because uh, at the end of the day, the last mile of this problem is a human behavior problem. It's not a radar or weather technology or numerical forecast problem. So the current warning system that we have, of course, goes uh, down from a, a time and space scale of very large, long, you know, on the order of days and regions, all the way down to hours and minutes, where we're talking about tornado watches and, uh, and perhaps tornado warnings. And there is a gap in this system, frankly. Uh, it's, it's a very deterministic system. It's binary. You're either warned or you're not warned. It presumes how people are going to respond. And of course, there's a lot more information available to be put into the system to deal with some of these gaps uh, in time and in space between watches and warnings uh, down to the actual event occurring on the scale of minutes. And so um, the warning system, you know, when you, you look at uh, maps on TV or your phone applications, you see these polygons that are used, they're kind of messy. They overlap and they're kind of confusing at times. Again, it's a very binary decision. And frankly, uh, there's a lot of overwarning. In fact, in um, the period 28, 2008 uh, to 2012, if you take all the tornado warning areas and add them together, okay, that's the red color that you see here. It's that big. It would have been that big, covered that much in the United States. And the actual tornado areas impacted was the yellow. So you can see the, the ratio of these shows the overwarning that happens. Now, we've got excellent forecasters. It's an excellent uh, system, but it's one that is, is really uh, geared toward the past, and we're looking toward the future. So NOAA has developed a, a new concept here called Forecasting a Continuum of Environmental Threats, or FACETS. It's basically a system that is, is going from a white sheet of paper. Let's, let's re-envision this whole system in light of the, the understanding and technologies that we have today, the, the importance of integration, integrating social behavioral sciences, uh, the better observations we have from radars and so on. Let's, let's re-envision the entire system. And so it basically threads together all of these various components of the system to look at environmental threats broadly, not just severe weather, uh, but also uh, other things that we'll look at here in a moment. So here's the general idea. Uh, going specifically looking at tornadoes where you have, say, severe storms here. This is just an example, uh, Tuscaloosa, Alabama tornado that happened. The black is the actual tornado track. And I'm going to animate this and say, you know, the way it's done today, of course, is that we warn, do a tornado warning based on polygons. So suppose that instead of doing that, we actually had much finer scale probabilistic warnings where the really warm, bright colors here indicate the highest threat of a tornado and the yellow colors indicate greater uncertainty. You might recognize this looking similar to the, the cone of uncertainty for a hurricane that's about to make landfall. And it turns out that with some of the technologies we have now, instead of warning such a big area, we could in fact provide a, a much narrower warning cone that changes in time much more rapidly than the tornado warnings do today. So we're gonna think about changing the starting point, moving from these binary polygons, you're either inside of a threat area that's warned or you're outside of it, to probabilistic hazards where the probabilities are more continuous. And they're based on grids that might be a model grid or uh, some other type of grid. And the legacy warnings kind of fall out of this structure naturally to where the high probabilities might be a, a tornado warning there. And then a proximity warning might be, well, the probability is not quite as high. Uh, so we're going to kind of make you aware, but you're not going to be warned in the traditional way that we are today. And again, not only for tornadoes, but a variety of threats, winter weather, hail, lightning, flooding, and, and so on. So what's beautiful about the, the uh, facets concept 
is you look at all the, the education preparation awareness, all of these social behavioral sciences, whether it's human factors, whether it's anthropology, psychology, whether it's linguistics and the communication of information, the output from numerical models and how that's portrayed through, uh, through uh, the media or other mechanisms of communication, all of this sort of the psychology of communication, all this is woven throughout the whole concept of facets. So uh, they call it the facets epoxy, the glue that puts it all together, the integrated social behavior and physical sciences all working together, not just sort of lashed together, but actually integrated in a very, very uh, fundamental and uh, thoughtful way. And so, uh, you know, if you kind of compare the typical strategy today of the polygon warning with the new facets method, where you actually have these continuously updated um, probability maps, uh, the overwarning would go down and you're providing much more actionable message. And you can imagine people getting alerts on their cell phones uh, to tell them, you know, how far they are away from the threat, what the probability is, maybe even where the nearest shelter is and what they ought to do, what action they ought to take. So we can get much more sophisticated with the capabilities we have today uh, and the technology as well, and certainly the understanding of human behavior. So the question fundamentally, I think, uh, from a scientific point of view is how predictable are severe storms and tornadoes? And you go back to Lorenz's work from the 60s and 70s, and, and it was based on some fairly simple models that had limitations, but they really did, I think, provide very useful guidance about predictability. But we do know that in some cases, um, those, those results are completely wrong. And in fact, if you look at some of the, uh, the literature today, a lot of questions remain. You look at some of the titles of these papers, you know, have we reached the limits of predictability of hurricane forecasting and, uh, you know, revisiting the limits of predictability and the implications. So there are a lot of questions that remain about this. And when I was uh, at the White House uh, directing the Office of Science Technology Policy uh, for, for a couple of years, uh, I started an initiative in predictability science. And we started really with earth system predictability and saying that, you know, we really need to revisit all of these fundamental issues of predictability science uh, for uh, atmospheric science and other things as well. And so that initiative got started in uh, October of 2020 and it's still going strong. And it's something I wanted to make you aware of because in, in the midst of all the things that we talk about in terms of technologies and human behavior, fundamentally, we need to understand how predictable something is because it helps us uh, determine how much of our um, time and energy and especially money should go towards um, a particular effort uh, for example, if we're nearing the limit of hurricane track forecasting, we probably don't want to spend much more money or much more emphasis on that, given the fact that hurricane intensity forecasting uh, continues to be such a, a tremendous challenge. So I will end there and uh, look forward to uh, the question and answer period. Again, I apologize that I'm not there with you, but I look forward to uh, hearing about how the discussions went and look forward to, uh, to uh, wonderful interaction in the future. So thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Dagmeyer excellent presentation on where we were in 1970s and 80s and how far we have come in terms of technology. And yet the threat to lives and property still high. Some questions come to my mind. Um, technology can give probabilistic forecast as you pointed out, but how do we connect action by people for different probabilities of forecast. Oh, thank you, Kishore, and, and thank you so much for the opportunity to join you this morning. Um, that's an excellent question. And in fact, I think it is one of the pivotal questions of how individuals uh, interpret information that they're provided when they're making decisions under stress in particular. Um, you know, a 30% chance of rain today is, is kind of confusing to a lot of people. They don't really know what it means. They kind of know what to do with it. If it's 80% chance, they know it's probably going to happen. So people kind of self-calibrate. But when we're talking about uh, tornadoes and, and really hazardous uh, weather, uh, it becomes a different story. And so it's not just the probabilities, I think, that we have to think about, but also how we turn that into appropriate messaging with social and behavioral sciences researchers guiding us to where what we actually convey will provide the intended outcome, the intended response on the part of, uh, of indi individuals receiving the information. Yeah, well, that, that's a good point. Now, that, there was a situation in Italy, if you remember, uh, where geoscientists in, in their forecast for earthquake had said the earthquake is not going to be very strong. And it turned out that the earthquake was strong and the geoscientists they were sued for uh, for the damage, and and it had gone to the 
court case in two, if I, as I recall actually, it was a toss up. I don't know who, who came out ahead on that. <laughs> You know, that's, that's a very important point. I think there was some activity similar to that that happened here in the U.S. Uh, some time ago. Um, and I, I think, you know, if it's with regard to uh, government meteorologists, I think to some extent the government employees are immune from, from lawsuits and so on. Of course, we really rely very heavily on the, on the media, the private sector, media, private sector uh, companies to convey information. They do an extraordinarily good job at that. And in fact, um, for the most part, the public relies on the internet. They rely on television and radio to actually get their information. I think that the key thing is that we want to be sure and train individuals to use proper wording uh, to not get people overly excited. In fact, we have found and research has shown that, that sometimes if you use overly hyperbolic language, it will drive people in uh, doing things in the direction of just the opposite of what you want to have them do. Uh, in some cases, we've seen people would actually flee their homes and store, instead of sheltering in place if, if the, the wording is such that there's a, an extremely dangerous tornado approaching or whatever, and that's exactly not what you want them to do. So I think a lot of work has been done and will need to be done to really understand those kinds of issues. And of course, liability is, is very important, but I think for the most part, uh, people do an excellent job. The professionals do an excellent job. We have storm spotters out there now. We have much more sophisticated tools. And certainly with, with um, uh, cell phones and, and video on cell phones and things like that, we have a, a much better ability to really know what's going on in real time. So, uh, But you're right. I think it really uh, it, it does get to a question of, is there a liability? And for the most part, I think people realize that um, the National Weather Service and the whole infrastructure that we have in this country, the multi-sector enterprise works quite well uh, in saving uh, uh, people from, from harm. In fact, the recent Andover tornado in, uh, in Kansas, it was another one, that, I think the last one was 1991, no one was killed in that tornado and it happened uh, after dark. So that, that's really an extraordinary statement, I think about our capabilities, but we, we have to do better as you say. Yeah, the, we, have, we have a long way to go, but even technically, uh, the question still remains, and if you don't mind my asking, how far are we from being able to uh, project or predict is uh, how strong the tornado will be? Right. That's a really great question. You know, we know from laboratory experiments uh, based on certain parameters, whether a tornado vortex uh, or tornado light vortex in a laboratory might be a single vortex or it might break down into smaller uh, sub vortices that are oftentimes viewed as being responsible for erratic damage. Um, I think we certainly know the, the parameters, the atmospheric parameters that characterize different types of storms, whether they're gonna be a single cell, a multi-cell, a, a supercell, and, and whether it's gonna produce a lot of hail and things like that. Uh, and, and so certainly the very large, dangerous, damaging tornadoes exclusively come out of the supercell tornadoes, excuse, excuse me, supercell storms. So if we focus on those uh, and, and understand quantities like helicity and other parameters that determine if storms rotate, what the likelihood of producing a tornado is, that's certainly a step in the right direction. We, we are doing field experiments and have been for a long time now of trying to understand why some storms on the same day, in the same you know, proximal environments, uh, one will produce a strong tornado and, and another one doesn't. And that's a very interesting problem. And uh, we don't yet really understand that. So it kind of gets to your question of, can we determine tornado severity in advance, even apart from using numerical models, which is, is quite a ways down the road, but I think there is some promise of that. Uh, but these proxy measures of storm severity are, are one of the key things that we have to go on now. And uh, I think uh, we'll certainly continue to learn more about that sort of thing as we, uh, as we do more research. Well, that brings up a question in, in my mind is uh, from the science point of view, uh, uh, what physics and parameters are lacking in understanding tornado producing thunderstorms? Yeah, that's a, another excellent question. I think uh, one of the things that has gotten a lot of attention is precipitation. Uh, you know, when we model precipitation back in the time frame that I was talking about uh, in my presentation, you know, we were using so-called bulk parameterizations, basically statistical models of, of how raindrops, if they collide, whether they break apart or whether they coalesce into bigger drops and things like that. Uh, parameterizations for precipitation, both frozen species and, and, and liquid species have gotten much, much more sophisticated, and much better. And we have found that in fact, there's a strong controlling influence there on storm behavior. So that's certainly one of the things that I think is, is vastly improved and continues to improve. Another thing is the treatment of surface friction. Uh, in numerical models where we model tornado-like vortices <clears throat> and even thunderstorms that produce tornadoes within the model, 
uh, there's great sensitivity to uh, surface friction effects. And <clears throat> we have not really figured that out uh, in terms of uh, when we turn on friction in the model, a, a lot of times it will kill a tornado off uh, when in fact we had ought to really be increasing the intensity of the tornado, like essentially what happens in a hurricane. Um, so we really don't understand uh, nearly well enough, I think, the effects of surface friction, surface roughness properties that can really affect a tornado. Uh, even though the storm itself is, is a major controlling influence, it's extraordinarily powerful, but the tornado itself seems to be sensitive to surface friction in ways that we don't really understand. So I would say the precipitation and the surface friction are two major areas where we really uh, need to improve our understanding. Yeah, and, and you made a good point on the surface friction because this is where the engineered or the engineer structure, the structures are. Right. They're very close to ground and that has been a challenge and continuing to have a challenge. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you made it. You made a very good point, and I hope we we learn from it. Uh, right. Yeah, those boundary layers uh, that are very thin. They might be on the order of just a couple hundred meters deep of air going into the tornado. Uh, you know, they can be extremely damaging. We see them in movies, but we don't really understand uh, to what degree they play a, a significant role. But you're right in terms of engineered structures and and the uh, durability of, of the built infrastructure. There's a lot that we really don't know. And again, our, our knowledge is advancing a lot. Uh, but I think what, what is exciting now to me is that we have both physical simulation uh, facilities where we can actually model very intense winds on actual structures. And then also including those kinds of things uh, in, our, in our numerical models where you take a, a model of the atmosphere, link it with an infrastructure model, link it with a storm surge model, things like that for hurricanes and really try to understand what, what the, um, the implications are for, for a built, uh, built infrastructure. Yeah, and one last question, uh, Dr. Doug Meyer, you have been in a unique position being on the board at NSF and at the director of OSTP for a couple of years. So you really have seen national research where it is going. Where do you anticipate our technology will continue to increase? Well, that's a great question. And I think one of the areas that um, is gonna be absolutely transformative, a few of them, in fact, uh, the first one would be artificial intelligence. Uh, in so many different areas of, of uh, society, uh, whether it's looking at educational attainment and whether your child is likely to succeed or looking at your own health, looking at our ability to project climate in the future, looking at numerical prediction of things like thunderstorms, we're already seeing uh, tremendous uh, impacts and positive advances due to art artificial intelligence. And of course, what we've lacked in the past, it's been around for, for many, many years, several decades, in fact, but we've lacked a lot of the data and the computational horsepower to be able to harness the capabilities of AI. So that's one major thing. Another one I would say <clears throat> is quantum computing which is further down the road. But if quantum computers really become a practical tool, which it looks like they will, there's still some, some interesting challenges to overcome. That could really also revolutionize lots of things, all the way from data security and communication security and cybersecurity to, in fact, our ability to, to model the weather, to predict atmospheric phenomena on extremely fine scales which is one of the things we really need to do to capture a lot of the detail. And, and in things like climate models, uh, getting clouds and precipitation much more um, uh, properly represented in things like hurricanes, where we can represent those explicitly in the model. So I think um, cyber, excuse me, uh, quantum computing is really going to be uh, quite transformative uh, activity. And there's several other things as well, but those two come to mind as, as being two national imperatives that will have long arcs of many decades of research and development. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kishore. Best wishes. Appreciate all your good work. Thank you very much.